Okay, today we're going to talk about an introduction to integral equations. Now, we've already looked at a variety of other ways of looking at fluids. Today we're going to try and get to the big picture. Now, previously, you've looked at statics. That was a pretty boring situation where the fluid wasn't moving at all. The velocity was equal to zero, and if we took that simple situation, we found that the pressure difference was equal to the density times gravity times the difference in elevation. So what that told us was there was a balance between gravitational forces going down, pressure forces going up, that allowed an individual little element in the fluid, let's draw one right here, to not be accelerating either downwards or upwards because gravity was pulling it down and the pressure being a little higher on the bottom than it was on the top was pushing it up so everything was in balance. Not very interesting but often very useful. Then we looked at Navier-Stokes equations. Those differential equations were very complex and they examined not just one little block but a whole lot of little differential volumes in there to figure out what was going on everywhere in the fluid. And that allowed us to understand, for example, that in this inlet pipe where fluid was coming in, we would have a velocity distribution that might look like this. Large towards the middle, smaller towards the outsides. On the other hand, down here coming out, we might see a different velocity distribution. Maybe more skewed to one side. Something like that. If we wanted to understand all of the details of what was happening in the flow, not just that there was a certain amount of flow coming in here and a certain amount coming out there, we would need to analyze at each of these little points with our Navier-Stokes equations and we'd wind up with a flow that in general was turning the corner but we'd also have to account for the fact that there's some recirculation happening down in that box there. Very complex and when we were done with that analysis we would know not just that flow was coming in and going out but we would know the velocity as a function of x, y, z, and time. We would know the pressure as a function of x, y, z, and time. So that we'd have a lot of detail about what was going on in that flow. And if we wanted to get that detail, we would really have to go and do some computational fluid dynamics to get all of that information out. A lot of times, we don't really need all of that information. We wanted to know instead, how hard do we have to push on this box to keep it from accelerating off this way as the fluid turns the corner? Because if this wasn't tied down, wasn't attached to something, then the fact that this fluid is turning the corner would tend to push the box off up, up this way. So we could take another approach. We could go to a black box sort of approach and say, inside this dotted line, I really don't know what's happening, and I really don't care very much. I do know that I've got some flow going in there at a given flow rate, and I do know that I've got some flow coming out here in a different direction at a given flow rate. What can I say about what's going on inside that black box that doesn't get me all the details, but still allows me to know the magnitude and direction of that force that's necessary to keep that box in place. So, maybe we can get away with just treating this like a black box and doing a force balance and a momentum balance on that black box. We still can balance F equal to M A. If we do that arrangement, then we should be able to figure out that force from knowing that this piece of fluid here has undergone an acceleration 
downwards in the y direction and towards the negative x direction in the x direction. So it has gone from going this way to slowing down and accelerating out there. That's that force that must have been applied. So what can we use? Well, we need to conserve mass. We did that over here with our Navier-Stokes and continuity equations, and we're going to have to do that over here. So the simplest one, well, Q out has to balance out with what comes in. If certain characteristics are, uh, if certain characteristics apply. So for instance, that would require that the density was constant so that the same volume flowing in and volume flowing out match up. And it would also require that our flow was steady. So in order to do this integral approach, we need to make some simplifications, but it will get us to something that we can do in a, a pencil and paper type calculation. In addition, if we want to do that mass balance and the momentum balance, we're going to have to make the assumption that we've got no viscous friction. Over here, between each of these little elements, if they're moving at different velocities, there will be viscous friction. If we don't know what's happening in the box, we can't take care of that viscous friction. So this is going to limit us. This is going to mean that we're not getting exact solutions we're getting practical estimates. And that very often is what we're looking for in an engineering environment. We're after something that's immediately useful. Over here, we're going to have to apply computational fluid dynamics. We're going to get more detail, and we'll have to spend more time getting those answers. So both of these are conserving mass. Both of these are conserving momentum. This one is going to take days to get you an answer. This solution over here on your engineering pencil and paper approach, you could probably get an approximate answer in an hour or so of analyzing a fairly detailed problem or even more quickly if it's a fairly simple problem. So over here, computational fluid dynamics to get you all the details. Over here, we have integral equations which will allow us to get quick answers that are good, solid, practical estimates for engineering applications.